So let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9. We have a familiar passage of Scripture here, Matthew chapter 9. And I want to take time to remind you over now the next few days uh, to be careful as you pull out onto Highway 96 after church. And again, I'll tell you, the, uh, the six lanes, really a turn lane, seven lanes. And if you'll be very, very careful as you pull out into all that traffic. Sometimes we have an officer there that helps us on Sunday mornings, but not always. And so if you're turning to go east, this way into town is very, very dangerous. And uh, so sometimes it's best just to kind of go out the back way or get on Gresham Lane and sit for a while in traffic, uh, go through the stoplight. And then uh, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to stop for that stoplight, amen? Uh, people here are crazy. I'll tell you that, crazy drivers. And red means stop. Last time I checked. Green means go, and yellow means roll through fast. Amen. <laughs> if you ever drive uh, I-24 I between here and Nashville, uh, I tell you, it's, it's, I know the speed limit's 70, sometimes it's 55, whatever, but it's typically uh, 80 and 90, and it's where God divides the quick and the dead, right there, you know, just right on that section of, of highway. Let's stand together, please, for the reading of God's Word, and let's be safe out there. Uh, I just am reminded that I have several police officers in the auditorium today, which I'm thankful for, but this is not where you confess that you break the speed limit. <laughs> I don't. All of our deacons do, but I do not. <laughs> Matthew chapter 9, we'll dive right into this, Matthew chapter 9. By the way, let me, before I get in this, I want to kind of set the stage. How many love this time of year? Amen. I mean, I, I know it's hot, a little early for the spunk, pumpkin spice and all that. But we have a pumpkin roll in the fridge right now. Glory to God. I don't know so much about the roll itself, but that cream cheese icing that's in there, I mean, oh, my. And uh, then, you know, to have that with a nice cup of coffee. Some of you would have that with maybe some hot cider. I don't know. But uh, it's all going on right now. And, uh, and the, 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 the pumpkins, we've got our, uh, we have our pump, pumpkins out. We've got that. Mums now, leaves are, I don't know if fall is coming, the leaves are just dying. I'm not sure, but it's starting to kind of turn a little bit. And this is my time of year. I love this time of year for many reasons. I love the cool mornings and the, the, the cool nights. And I'm thankful and grateful that we still have seasons. And for all you climate change individuals, I want you to know the Bible says we'll have seasons till Jesus comes back. That's what the Bible says. So uh, anyway, if you're a climate change person, we need to preach a different message today. Look at verse number 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now remember, Jesus was limited in that he was traveling this earth at this moment in his earthly body. So when the Bible says every disease and every sickness, uh, at that point he was not doing it in other locations, although he can do that now. Uh, but he chose to veil himself, veil his deity. He was 100% God and 100% man. But when he went into a location where there were sick, he took care of every one of them. When he went into a location where there was disease, these cities, these villages, these hamlets, uh, he would take care of every one of them. What a God. What a God. Verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, this is a very specific passage of Scripture and something that I've asked God to burn in all of our hearts today. I'll draw your attention to verse uh, number 38. I'd like for us to read that out loud together. Verse 38, ready? Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. I'm going to speak on this for just a while this morning. A love for harvest time. A love for for harvest time. Father, bless your word. As the pastor of these dear people and as a preacher of the gospel, I so much want to stand in the gap and make up the hedge 
and make that which we have read this morning real to all of us. And I pray that we would all take heed, for we're in harvest time right now. And teach us to be about your business, please, we pray. And help us to catch a love for this time of year, we ask you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I have never owned a farm. I love them. Love to be on them. Love to be around them. When I was younger, I was always around a farm, both me and my wife. We grew up in West Virginia. And my grandpa Turner, he owned a farm. Uh, his first working farm was in Rock Castle, West Virginia. He had a heart attack and uh, felt like he needed to scale down. And he moved to Ripley, West Virginia. When he moved there, uh, he per took some of the money and purchased another farm, about 100 acres in Frozen Camp, West Virginia. And that was the one that uh, dad or mom inherited. And dad worked after my grandfather passed away. And so we spent a lot of time on that farm. And then my father-in-law had a farm. And my wife spent some time there. They had a house in town and they had a, another house on the farm and they would go almost every day and sometimes on weekends would stay there on the farm. And uh, so uh, we were always around uh, a farm and, and I, I worked for a farmer when I was a young boy and then a teenager and learned how to do some things. I, I've never been a farmer and I've never owned a farm. So those of you who have had farms and you are a farmer, I'm not polished in this but I've been around farming enough to be dangerous. And I've been around enough of it to have some of it in my blood. Yesterday, my wife and I were driving back from a visit, and we were coming through the country, and we saw a standing field of corn. And I looked at that corn, and of course it's all brown now, and the ears are, are hanging down, and some of the stalks had uh, three and some had four ears of corn and we just kind of slowed down and we both thought this about the same time uh, man that field is right for the harvest and by the way the next big field we came to the uh, corn picker was there and and they were harvesting that field and I thought man this thing is ripe and this thing is ready and uh, I don't know about you but I had this sudden urge to stop the car and get out and pull off an ear from my wife and pull off an ear from me. By the way, we talked about this this morning, and we never said anything, but we talked about it this morning. And we wanted to just kind of pull off an ear of that corn and just shell that corn. How many ever have shelled corn by hand? Now, uh, I know there are corn shellers, and uh, there's corn crackers, and, you know, we, we uh, but when I was a little boy, I, I never shelled a whole lot of corn, but my, my grandpa Turner had a way when the corn was ripe in the field, he'd bring a couple baskets there and sit on the front porch under the shade trees, and, uh, and the grandkids would come out, and we'd uh, take the corn, and we'd shell that corn, and we'd start at the small end, and we'd just kind of take our hand like that, and we'd just kind of knock off. Man, it's, just kinda, it's kind of addicting. It's kind of like bubble wrap. Bubble wrap. My, my, my staff knows that I use that for stress relief. Some pastors pray, which is really stress. I, I pop those little bubbles on bubble wrap. They're just addicting. I like them big bubbles now. Boy, I, I don't know where I got off on that. But, but I, I just got to thinking, that was kind of fun. Uh, we just kind of shell that corn off. We get a big old basket of that and kind of <laughs> run our hands through that corn, you know. And Grandpa, he'd roll in some molasses in all of that and, and use it to, to, uh, to, to bring the cows in. And, and I remember those days. Now, my Grandpa Turner, though we had a, a corn sheller that did it in a rapid way, but, uh, but for those of you city slickers that don't know, that's where you take the, the dry corn and it just kind of just pops off the ear when you when you shove that 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 husk or take the husk off and you shove that cob through there. Now now does anybody know what I'm talking about now? Now my grandpa Turner, his old arthritis hands are almost kind of. Uh, he would take that corn and before he he would he would shell a lot of it whatever got the corn sheller and his hands would kind of dry and split and crack because he shelled so much corn. But I got to thinking today. You know, that was a little, little blast in the past that, that came back to my mind yesterday. And I got to thinking, why would my grandpa bring a, a, a bushel basket full of dry corn for us to shell that corn? I will tell you why. He wants to get a little taste. He get a little taste of the harvest. To get a little taste of what it was like 
to raise a crop from seed and see God water it and, and bring up the crop and then be able to see the, the value of getting that in a, an old metal bucket and rolling in some molasses and taking that out and suck it, suck, suck, suck it, and call those cows. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever call cattle? Come on. Let's call a little cattle today with a little amen. How about that? And uh, see those old cows come in and, and just kind of give you just a little flavor, just a little taste of seeing a, a crop come all the way harvest. I, I, when I was a boy, we, we, we'd do all that. My grandpa uh, had just such a love for the harvest. Uh, and the world came to a stop when it was harvest time. It didn't matter if it was corn. It didn't matter if it was hay. It didn't matter if it was sugar cane. And he would do all he could uh, to get that crop in because he had a love for the harvest. And he tried to instill that in us. I mean, even with hay time. I mean, when I was just a little boy, we couldn't lift them big old 70, 80 pounds, pound, pound of hay. We couldn't get them on the wagon. But uh, he'd get us out there on the tractor. He let us run, drive that tractor in his lap. He let us sit on that, uh, that uh, vendor uh, and watch him mow the hay. And some of you think, well, that was child abuse right there. No, it was a whole lot of fun. And, and we even rode in the back of the truck with the tailgate down. How about that? We drank out of a water hose, praise God, and rode a bicycle without a helmet. Amen. We did dangerous things back and had a BB gun. And so those are the days. And, and my grandpa had a way of letting us get a little taste of that. And then we get old enough to where we get out and learn how to take that knee and run that knee and shove that big old bell of hay up on there. And then we got big enough and strong enough where we could throw it up on and put the tie bell on top of the old wagon. You might know what a tie bell is. That's the last one to keep the load. Fall. Anyway, I got to move on. I got to preach. I'm going to get the, I'm reminiscing right now. And, and even the sugar cane and, and grandpa, he'd grow that big old tall cane. And, and man, he would, we would, when we were kids, it was work getting out there and cutting that sugar cane. But he wanted us to get a, he wants us to get a feel of it, a love for it, a taste of it. And he'd get us down around that meal and he let us draw, taste the first draw of molasses glasses off that, that meal, and Grandma would have those old cat had biscuits down there, and have butter ready, and man, whenever that, that, that would come off, and uh, that molasses, we put that on that hot biscuit, and, and that butter, and boy, glory to God, you can still get that some places around town, but what, if you, how many have never had molasses? May God help you. You got to have them. And, and, and God gave us such a love for that, that my dad got the molasses meal, we did all that, and to this day, uh, to this day, especially in the spring, I can roll down my window and I can smell a fresh mowing field of hay. How many of y'all can do that? And I, I can just smell it. I can smell molasses cooking off. And, I, and, and, and Grandpa had a way of letting us get it in, get in our blood and a taste for the season. And when I roll into this season in the fall and, and the, uh, the, the air cools down and the beautiful sunset and the full moon we saw just the other night, and all of that comes into play. And you kind of hear the dogs barking a little longer as the sky seems to lower. It's a beautiful time of year. And, and, and you begin to smell the wood smoke some as we move into fall to wintertime. It's just little sights and little sounds that makes my mind go go back to the love I have for getting in the crop. And can I say that Jesus Christ loves this the same way? We need to understand about our Savior that when harvest time came, Jesus had a love for harvest time. And by the way, we all win souls all the time, and all the time is harvest time, but especially certain times of the year. Now stick with me. I want you to jot these same things down. Number one, notice please, first of all, Christ's compassion for the harvest. His compassion for the harvest. The Bible says here in verse 35 that he went to all of the cities and villages. Would you circle that word all, please? Now, you say, what do you think that means? That means in his geographical location there, as he based himself out of the city, and as he moved out of uh, Nazareth in that particular area, and he would go to all the cities. Uh, let me just stop and say this. The Franklin Road Baptist Church can do a better job. This church is, is uh, for Murfreesboro, Tennessee, but it's also for Smyrna. It's also for Eagleville. 
It's also for Rockvale. It's also for some of the other towns around us. And you and I need it. By the way, there are people here represented from all those towns. There are folks even here from Nashville. But understand, if Jesus had set up shop right here and he'd been given the gospel, preaching the kingdom of, of, of the gospel, he would be going to all the cities and villages. By the way, I thank God for those yellow chariots back there we call the bus ministry that goes into many of these places. And you ought to pray for that ministry. Thank God for them. But you and I ought to be busy getting the gospel out uh, to all these cities and keep gospel tracts in our pockets so we can tell other people about Jesus Christ in all of the cities and villages. Notice, please, that he he taught in the synagogues, and he preached everywhere he could get a crowd. You say, what did he preach? The Bible says here that he preached the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. You say, well, well what is the gospel of the kingdom? Well, for the Jews, for the Jews, the gospel of the kingdom is the good news message of repentance, redemption, and restoration offered by God to all who receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament, and it was the Jews that were rejecting Jesus Christ. It was the Jews that should have known better. And so when he preaches the gospel of the kingdom, he's preaching that to those Jews. And what about us? Well, for you and I, for the Gentiles, both then and now, uh, the gospel of the kingdom is the message of salvation, proclaiming Jesus that is God and was crucified, buried, and risen again in the grave. How many thank God for that? That's the good news of the gospel. After Christ's death and resurrection, when Philip the evangelist preached in Acts 8, 12, he preached the good news of the kingdom of God. Men and women believed and were baptized. There are a lot of people that like, like to make a big difference between how, how a Jewish person gets saved, how a Gentile gets saved, ladies and gentlemen. In this dispensation, they all get saved the same way. And that is belief in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How many believe right now Jesus Christ is God? And he was born of a virgin. And he lived a sinless life. How many believe he was crucified on Calvary? He was buried three days. Someone say amen right there. And on that third day, he got out of the grave. Our choir was singing about that today. I'm so glad I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I thank God for that. And the Bible teaches us right here that Jesus shared this in all the cities and villages. Uh, the Bible says here that uh, uh, he had a burning compassion. He was moved uh, for the, the men and women in those cities. And as he preached this, he preached it to prove and demonstrate it that he was God. Jesus would go in and not just preach the kingdom, but he would heal every sickness. Uh, Jesus would not just heal every sickness. He also healed, the Bible says in these verses, every disease among the people. In other words, Jesus would perform these great miracles to prove that he was God. He could have rolled into that village. He could have rolled in that city and preached the gospel and been just as powerful. But something notable was different about Jesus. When Jesus walked in to that city, he had compassion, and people knew they'd bring the sick to him. You say, why did he do that? He wanted to prove that he was God with those miracles. In this same chapter, we won't go back and read all of it, but in chapter 9, in the first few verses, the Bible says that he entered into his own city. His own city was in Nazareth. He did not do a lot of miracles in Nazareth. But on that day, they brought one to him that was on a bed, uh, sick of the palsy, and he was lying there and, and could not move and had, had no control over his body. And I remember as, he, as they brought him to Jesus, one of the cities there of Nazareth, and all the Jews and Pharisees and scribes were standing around, they brought this, this, uh, this uh, invalid man in and laid him before Jesus. And he said to him, uh, Son, thy sins be forgiven. That's all he said. And uh, when he said that, boy, the Jews started working their brains, and Jesus, as God, could read their mind, and he said, uh, uh, what, what's wrong with you boys? Was that not enough? I mean, uh, thy sins be forgiven. I have the rights. They, they, and they thought that was blasphemous. He's putting himself out, up as God. Only God could forgive sin. And he looked at those boys and he said, which is easier for me to say, thy sins be forgiven or take up thy bed and walk? One of the human answer for that question would be this. Well, it's easier to say your sins be forgiven because uh, we don't really know what's going to happen with that. We don't think you're God anyway. But the harder thing would be to take up thy bed and walk. And Jesus knew what they were thinking. 
And by the way, you think the same thing too. I mean, it's just really hard to believe that Jesus Christ forgives sin, but how many thank God that he does? And so to prove himself, to demonstrate, to prove that he was God, that he was deity, he looked at that man, and the Bible says that he said, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thine own way. And he arose and departed to his house. <laughs> you talk about, you talk about uh, knock up the side of the head. I mean, those Pharisees had no idea what to say. The Bible says the crowd rejoiced and they marveled in what took place. And may I say that Jesus Christ would go into these cities and he would heal uh, sickness and he would heal disease to prove. But then uh, something happened. Something happened. The Bible says in verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, look at it now, he was moved with compassion on them. He was moved with with compassion on them. What does that mean, Pastor? It means his emotions began to swell on him. And by the way, I reported to you earlier that Jesus Christ was 100% God and 100% man, but as, as man, he, he felt human emotions. He had the ability to cry. He had the ability, the Bible says, to hunger. He had the ability to thirst and all those things. And thank God, uh, uh, he suffered as we would suffer. But something happened to him that day. He was moved. I, I don't know, and I was not there, but I, uh, the context of the passage and the, and the Greek rendering of those words, if you'll trust me, this means he... Have you ever done that? Have you ever began to heave? I got this thing with my heart. It's AFib, and, and uh, if I start to cry... Uh, if I start to cry, it's not all the time, but sometimes it'll take off on me. And so uh, I, I hate to tell you that sometimes if it's nothing really to cry about, I try not to cry. But uh, my, wife will, my, my, my wife will tell me something. She says, don't, 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 don't cry. Don't, don't cry. Don't anyway, but, but, but it, that's how I am as a man. I don't always show my tears. But I know what it is to start to heave inside. Does anybody know what I'm talking about right now? start to heave and the disciples saw that and he turned to them and he said the harvest is plenteous I don't know he said this but of course all the words are not recorded in scripture but these John said are recorded that we might believe but he could have said ah, look, look at this this is unbelievable look at this then he turned to them and he said, as he was heaving, as, as the, the emotion of, of, of agony was on his face, he said that the laborers are few. The Bible indicates uh, why he made those statements, and I want to give you kind of three of them. What did he see? Well, I had this first one down. He saw, he saw those searching were plenteous. I mean, he described them as a sheep with no shepherd. They had no guide. People there uh, wandering about, nobody was showing them anything spiritually. May I say today that that is, I, I can't say about the rest of the world, and we understand that most of the world is unsafe, but even here in America, one nation under God, it appears to me that we're wandering around with no one to guide us. Now, I don't know if it's stubbornness. They don't want anybody to tell them anything. Or I don't know if they, people just in, a, in, in America, they think they know everything. I can't tell you what it is. But I can tell you what. This nation is coming apart at the seams and the, wheel, and the wheels are falling off this nation because they're wandering as, as, as people, as sheep, having no shepherd. And I think Jesus looked at them and said, uh, uh, these, are, these are those created in the image of my, my heavenly Father. And, and what Jesus knew about, the fact that, that we're creating his image, he knew that they were people that with a void deep down in their heart. And let me just say this. I, I don't care what you believe theologically. God's not one of the, willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he knew that every one of those souls out there wondering had a void deep down in their soul that needed to be filled and could only be filled with, with Almighty God. I mean, have you ever wondered why, why animals don't commit suicide? Have you ever wondered why dogs and cats don't go somewhere and jump off a bridge? I mean, they get fleas, they get the mange. We don't feed them, don't sometimes don't take care of them like we should. And they, they just, they could just, you ever wonder why a cat just don't end it all when all their hair falls off and no one takes care of it? Don't go jump off a bridge somewhere. 
You ever wonder about that? Now, I'm going to upset some of you right here, but I'm going to give you a Bible for it. I'm going to tell you why. They don't have a soul. God breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life, and he became a living what? They don't say much about Rover there or Fuffy, but I will tell you this. Down inside of every person inside this auditorium is a hole right there that only Jesus can fill. Jesus is and he always has been the answer to those that are confused, to those that do not have uh, uh, their way guided by someone. God is the person that feels that. Oh, yeah. He saw this, uh, this crowd and he looked at this great harvest. And let me just say, that everyone you come in contact are lost without the Lord, no shepherd to guide them. I get Brother Phil Wheeler does the, it's called Harvest Time um, uh, uh, Crusade, and he goes to the fairs, and, and when he gets to this time of year especially, he has a great harvest of souls. I think, I think the fair in Lawrenceburg the other day had nearly 80 saved. He told me he, he'd been sick a few days with a virus, but he, he and his grandson got back in there. I think they had nearly 80 saved this past week. He said there, he said, Pastor, I, we're swamped. I've never seen people come. He said, they're coming young and old like they're coming. And sometimes he'll send me pictures of all that. I'm just saying that the fields are white, ripe under harvest. And can I say this? When somebody is lost... Right now, if you lost a child or you lost a grandchild and they were out there in the dark and you didn't know where they were, let me just say this, everything stops until that child is found. Everything stops. I want you to think for just a moment. Our little granddaughter the other day, uh, my, my wife, she's just a nana and you know, she just don't want a kid to get out of her sight. And the other day, the other day, a little... A little uh, Blakely, I have to think about her name because we call her everything. We call her Boo Boo, Shuggy, Shuggy Bear. And so she was watching, and, and she's older now, and she's a toddler, two and a half years old. She goes everywhere. And she went down the hallway, and my wife, my wife called for her, and she answered, but my wife didn't hear her, and she called for her. And then she hollered out real loud, Blakely Monroe, where are you? She came out and she was crying and she grabbed a hold of Nana and just, just scared her so bad. And then she got about half mad at her. But I'll tell you what, it was just a few seconds, but everything stopped. So that little girl was found. And may I say that you and I need to understand that those around us that are lost and they're wondering, Jesus Christ cares for them. We see, first of all... <laughs> Those searching were plenteous. Those stressed are plenteous. Those stressed, the Bible uses the word they fainted, meaning they, they had pretty much given up in life and they were just existing. In Jesus' day, this was the norm. You had the rich and the poor. You didn't have no middle class. And unless you figured it out, there's a squeeze and a pressure on the middle class right now in our nation that if something doesn't change, it's going to squeeze the middle class completely out. And we have, we'll, we'll get back to where we were once were, the rich and the poor. But may I say the rich and the poor and the middle class can all become stressed and faint. In Jesus' day, this was going on today. We're living in a, in a time, and it's all over the news right now, of decaying mental health. And the streets are filling up. Usually the headline, the headline news, <coughs> in our, our news, has something to do with Nashville, them trying to close down another homeless area. Maybe you're watching what's going on in New York and, and other, and I know there are, there are political reasons for all this. I'm not getting on that. I'm just saying it is what it is, folks. There are people around us that have no place to live. They're everywhere. They're right here in our little town. I could name the areas right now. And uh, our little town, I'm, I'm just saying, but it even goes deeper than that. I mean, our, our mental institutions are full and, and uh, prisons are overflowing. And, and I'm just saying, the burden of life is coming so heavy and that there are folks that get to the place where they say, I give up. I don't have the income 
no one, <laughs> I've, I've been in so much trouble, I can't seem to function in life. And there are people who just kind of walk away. And I know you're saying this, where well, there are jobs everywhere, the people go take those jobs. But you need to understand, I'm not taking up for this crowd. I'm just saying there is a, a mental condition that incapacitates a person where they say, I'm done with life. And there may be people sitting right in here today that you have an income and you have a home and you have a family, but you think nothing is going your way and you're hanging by a thread today. I want you to understand that Jesus is right where you're at and he wants to come and help you out of that. Jesus is and always has been the answer. Then he saw this. He saw those sorrowful. And Jesus, as he busied himself with those sick and diseased, these were weeping people. You don't, I visit in the hospitals and the funeral homes too much to not know that every time there's people struggling with worry and sorrow and they're, they're weeping people, they're worried people, they're weary people. Some have been to doctor after doctor and I, uh, the big thing right now is they tell you what's going on but they, the big thing now is they say, we have no idea why you have it. Well, so-and-so died suddenly but we have no idea why they died. Is anybody with me right now? And that brings sorrow and pressure on a person like no other. And I, I want to stop and say this before I move on. If you're not sick right now, you ought to praise God. Sickness and disease creates such a burden, and Jesus wants to help lift that load. We ought to give him the praise every time he does it. I want to give you these next two points, and I'll do it quickly. Number two, we see Christ's concern for the harvest. Christ's concern, verse 37, he turns to his disciples in tears and he says, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Jesus is here addressing a problem in his day that continues to plague Christianity. We've got a big harvest. We've got a big harvest all around us and not enough reapers. Ripe crops will stand in the field and rot unless the people inside these four walls go out and tell them, about Christ and the next chapter the disciples are named in chapter 10 he'd already gathered them we believe by other gospel writers but we know that Peter and Andrew had already joined him and and James and John and Matthew and now he names these guys and chapter 10 tells them you're the 12 that's going to get the job done and then lastly we see Christ's call for the harvest Christ's call for the harvest. He says in verse 38, pray ye therefore, therefore mean because of what was just mentioned in Scripture. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. What is Christ's call for the harvest? It's for the church of the living God, God's people, believers, would pray and ask for reapers, ask for laborers. Oh, we must pray. I was convicted of this again this past week as a pastor, but sometimes I, want, I feel like I'm the only one praying. Dear God, we need more bus workers. Dear God, we need more Sunday school teachers. Dear God, we need more nurse workers. Dear God, we need more choir people. Dear God, we need more soul winners. Dear God, we need more door walker, knockers. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm, I, I feel like I, we, we even have vacancies on staff. We even pay people to do the work of God. This is a plague not just with this ministry, but every ministry I'm familiar with, they're all begging for help pray some of you recall the story of the Windrow church years ago it's occupied now but when it was vacant we would get permission take a group of men out around this time and we would pray out there and the Windrow church just about six seven miles from here the largest and longest ongoing camp meeting revival was held there and it was started in the early 1800s when a big earthquake hit the what is called the Real Foot Lake region. In fact, Real Foot Lake, you've heard me tell this story, was formed because of the craters and so forth from that earthquake. Back in those days, they did not have accuracy in weather or meteorologists. Neither do we in our day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's much, much more accurate. But they had no idea. They thought the world was coming to an end. They really believe that. Revivals start up all around the region, everyone that felt that. 
where we get the idea of the camp, camp meeting revivals and, and those days that people would come to harvest time, they would harvest their crop and whenever their crop was out of the field and in the barns, they would reload their wagons and they would put bacon in there and dry goods and they would go to the closest camp meeting. And just about six or seven miles from here, uh, there was one of those there. And it lasted for several years. History says, and I have the history back in my office, that over 3,000 people came to Christ over the years in that small piece of real estate. I just drove by it yesterday. They were mowing the grass around the church and the grounds there. And sometimes I like to stop and think, they actually, there's a church there now when the Revival ended, they built a church, they called it Wind Road Church. You know what, do you, how, many, how many farmers know what a wind row is? Hold your, hold your hand, you know what a wind row is? Well, those who do not know what a wind row is, typically in our generation, is a row of hay. It can be a row of something that's been dried in the field and freshly turned over by a rake and is put in a straight line so the baler can come around and, and pick that crop up out of the field. Wind row. And it takes the idea of success when the wind rows of Israel were straight and long, it was a picture of harvest time and success of getting the crop out of the field. And I thought about that, and as I drove by, I began to reminisce. And oh, how we need that again in America. We need a, we need a revival time. Here our Lord tells us to pray for that, to pray for a great harvest of souls, to visualize it. In other words, see it. Take our eyes off of self. Get our ears tuned to spiritual things. Get our lips speaking for God. Get our hands surrendered to God. We're to visualize it. We're to, we're to agonize. Fervently pray for revival. Not just whisper a prayer, but, but, but pour our hearts and out in heart-rending prayer to God that God would send us revival. And then not just visualize and agonize, but begin to evangelize and open our mouth wide and let God feel it giving out the gospel. Some of you, you that I've pastored for a long time, we've had revival here before. I have my old Bible. It's away at the binder. Now I actually have the dates in my old Bible, so I don't have them in front of me. But I distinctly remember around 2009, 2010, as we were finishing the building out here, those years right there in 2011, oh, what a, what a great inflow God gave us. Many came to Christ, and many came and joined our church, and, and the Spirit was sweet and wonderful. And I thank God for the Spirit in our church now, and I thank God for what we have now. But could, could you just see, those of you who were with us then, and saw that revival then, and what God has done, and how God has built to this point, this crowd of people that's before me right now, could you just see what God, could you understand what God could do if we would just visualize it? Begin to pray, as Jesus said, and begin to look at the crowds around uh, this church and our neighborhood and ask God about it and ask him to send his revival. And today, I, I know a Sunday morning message maybe is a little different than this, but I remember those days. And I, remember, I remember how God put marriages back together, and I remember how God just did something special. And I'll just say this, to a certain extent... I'm just speaking as your pastor now, if I can. To a certain extent, much of that has continued. Back in those days, we didn't have any money. We were borrowing large sums of money and, and, and to, to build. And now here we are, and the buildings are built and paid for and money in the bank. And if I could just be very personal right now, and I, I don't do this quite often, I don't do this often on Sunday morning, but I can be very personal right, personal right now. This church, I only pastor this church. I don't know about other churches. This church has never been more poised for revival than it is right now. I meet with our deacons, and they understand the behind the scenes and, and the idea of things that have gone on. And I know, that we, I know that we talk a lot about it. And some of you say, well, I'd like to see it. You'll know it when you see it. You'll know it. 
some of you remember that. Some of you were with me in Thailand years ago. We went up in those hill tribes. We preached in all those villages and people come. We saw great masses of people and they came to Christ. I, as, a, as a preacher, I'd never seen anything like it. They just didn't have technology and a lot of things to stop them from, from being at meetings. And we would roll into a hill tribe village and, and the whole village would come out, all of them. They'd hang out the windows, they'd listen. And very simple message, you really didn't have to study for it. You just knew simple things that you would say and give the gospel, and, and many would come to Christ. I, have, I do not remember how many got saved. I do remember that we baptized nearly 80. We had, sometimes we'd go up in a, in a, in a meeting, and we'd have people saved, and, and then they would just go down to the little, little river or creek. We'd, have them, we'd, we'd baptize them, six, seven, eight, ten. And then sometimes we would go and they would have built a, a big a pool kind of thing, looked like an above the ground septic system really, but it, about 1,000, 2,000 gallons and, and there'd be little polywogs swimming around in that. But they would, they would come and we baptized five or six up on one mountain. I remember you could see for miles. And then as we closed the thing out down, uh, back down to the children's home, they all came in, hundreds and hundreds came in, and that day we baptized nearly 40 on that day. I got so tired of baptizing folks. I baptized, the missionary baptized, I would baptized, we took turns. And nobody left, and everybody stayed in the hot sun. They watched all of it, they were part of all of it. And I just have never seen anything quite like it. And can I say that I long for those days? Uh, you and I can go to heaven. Jesus Christ is coming again. How many believe he's coming again? Say amen. We can go to heaven, just dry as cracker juice if that's what you want to do. But I'd just soon go to heaven, fired up, heaven bound with a hammer down. See God bring a revival. Let's stand together, please.